Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what progress it's making with the establishment of a South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The second phase of the Enterprise and Skills Review has been exploring options for the new South of Scotland vehicle. Those will be set out in the Phase 2 report, which I expect to be published shortly after the general election. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, can he cast uh, any more light on what representation the South of Scotland is likely to have on the Implementation Board? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, we are delighted to have the new uh, vehicle. We are the first government to actually do that. Uh, many people have talked about it, but we are doing that. We are equally determined that the South of Scotland should have its interests represented on the Implementation Board. But as with the previous answer when I spoke about the South of Scotland vehicle, uh, the nature of the Implementation Board uh, will be announced very shortly and following on from both the completion of Phase 2 of the review and the general election. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm wondering if the Cabinet Secretary is aware that I'm supporting efforts in the south of Scotland to create a national tourist route similar to that of the North Coast 500, and early estimates suggest that the project may require between £10,000 and £15,000. Does he believe that the new south of Scotland enterprise vehicle will be a key potential source of funding for such a project? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I welcome the initiative taken by Emma Harper, and she's quite right to emphasise the success of the North Coast 500. Uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing the work of uh, the new agency in terms of this interesting initiative. It will be, of course, for that vehicle once established to have the role in helping to develop the visitor economy in the south, working with other organisations to ensure communities and businesses benefit. But decisions, as you will know, uh, about project funding will be for the new vehicle to take forward. But I'm sure the new vehicle will be very grateful to have interesting ideas such as the one put forward by Emma Harper. Daniel Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I can't help notice the prominence of the word vehicle in the Minister's response to those questions. Can he reassure us that the South of Scotland vehicle will be a separately constituted organisation with its own uh, administration, bureaucracy and ability to act independently from other bodies uh, and organisations? Minister, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I wouldn't uh, ask uh, Daniel Johnson to read too much into the word vehicle. I think it's fairly understood what that means. We are talking about, as he describes, a separate agency. We've said that in previous statements. Uh, of course, there are different ways to get to that uh, end game. It will take some time through primary legislation to establish an agency like that. And there is an interesting uh, series of options available to the government in relation to how we get to that stage, how we make sure that the south of Scotland has its interests represented in the meantime. I've asked my officials to uh, set up meetings with each of the opposition parties so I can have that discussion. There are a range of options and I'm perfectly willing to listen to uh, suggestions in relation to that. But I do think it is important to point out that this vehicle, this agency, is one that's been established by the Scottish Government and is long overdue. Thank you. I noticed the member uh, oh, here he is. for question number two is coming in the chamber at the back at the moment. Yes. Well, th just, just to let the Chamber understand, the, the, the Bureau gave permission for the Petitions Committee to overrun because they were taking evidence from uh, survivors of transvaginal, transvaginal mesh. And I believe the member, as the Chair of the Health Committee, was present at that meeting. We now come to question number two, if the member has... Okay. <laughs> Question number two, Neil Findlay. Thanks very much for the indulgence, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that subcontractors who work on the Scottish Future Trust projects are paid in time by the contractor. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. This is a matter for the relevant public body to monitor. The standard contract forms used for MPD and hub projects include provisions about the payment of subcontractors by the main contractor who is required to keep records of such payments for inspection by the public body from time to time. Thank you very much. Neil Findlay. Thanks, President Officer. I'll try not to keel over when I ask my question. Um, I have a contractor in my region uh, who's been working on a big college project, but who has been having major problems getting paid by the subcontractor. Uh, it appears that this is common across a number of projects. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with me about this uh, uh, issue? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to look at the individual circumstances uh, that, that the member ha has raised and, record, uh, and uh, respond accordingly. 
It's not my belief that this is commonplace because there is monitoring in place, but I'm happy to look at the specifics and then return to the member. Julian Martin. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary are there are things that prevent the Scottish Government from taking the action it wishes to encourage fair work practices? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's fair to say that the Scottish Government has gone further than other administrations in terms of um, fair work. Uh, but we could go further if we had full legislative authority in this area, and that's all the more reason to press the UK Government for the full devolution uh, of employment law, so we could go even further uh, in terms of, of this uh, agenda. But I could cite a number of good examples where we made progress, such as the Fair Work Convention. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What action is the Scottish Government taking to ensure that businesses pay their smaller suppliers faster a recent report by the Federation of Small Businesses in Scotland showed that adopting the payment practices of Norway would see 2,075 fewer firms closing annually in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the Scottish Government's got a good, strong track record in paying those that we procure services from. We uh, publish those uh, statistics uh, as well, and we're also taking forward project bank accounts, which ensure that subcontractors are paid, and I'd encourage their use as well, and we'll roll out further guidance uh, on that. Thank you. Question three has not been lodged. Question four, Mary Evans. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it has sought assurances from the UK Government that Scotland's fishing industry will not be used as a bargaining chip in Brexit negotiations. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, despite numerous and continuing attempts by the Scottish Government to secure such assurances, the UK Government has of course given no guarantee that it will not bargain away access to Scottish waters in its Brexit negotiations. This lack of assurance raises a very real concern that the UK Government is once again ready to treat the Scottish fishing industry as expendable. I can give our fishing industry assurances, however, that in every possible scenario for Scotland's future, this Government will always stand up for and champion Scotland's fishing interests. Mary Evans. I thank the Minister for that answer. Now, he'll be aware um, that in Theresa May's plans for Brexit, the Tories say, and I quote, given the heavy reliance on UK waters of the EU fishing industry and the importance of EU waters to the UK, it's in both our interests to reach a mutually beneficial deal that works for the UK and the EU's fishing communities. Now, does the Minister agree with me that the UK Government's plans to allow EU boats access to Scotland's waters as of right is regrettable and would be detrimental to Scotland's fishing interests? Minister. I can hear the Conservatives chuntering away. They don't like to hear the truth when they're confronted with it because for months leading up to the referendum, those in favour of Brexit talked about taking back control. The current UK fisheries minister promised hundreds of thousands of tonnes of extra fish for the UK fleet. And yet, now the negotiations have started, we see the true colours of the UK government. Once again, fisheries appear to be the first thing on the list of expendables. Scottish waters are some of the most valuable in Europe and the Scottish fleet, one of the most successful, protecting the interests of our fleet in international negotiations, whether in relation to exiting the EU or fishing quotas, is vital to our fishermen and to the coastal communities that rely on fishing industries. And it's only this government, this SNP-led Scottish government, that will continue to stand up for Scottish fishing interests, as has been proved time and time again. Peter Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. Now, given that the latest correspondence from Westminster, namely the private letter from Andrea Leadsom to Bertie Armstrong, which has been leaked by the First Minister, and is quite specific in that we are leaving the CFP, taking control of our waters to 200 miles, is the, is the Minister like me very much clearer on the way forward for fishing post-Brexit, and it is certainly not expendable? Minister. Well, I'll take no lectures from a Tory party that has sold our fishermen down the river, not for years, but for decades. Let's remind them, presiding officer, about what was said by David Mundell before the EU referendum vote. I think the fishermen are wrong in the sense there's no way we would just go back to Scotland or Britain controlling British waters. He said, I would say the idea we would go back to a position where we're entirely in control of our own fishing industry is not one that is realistic. The fishing communities of Scotland will not want Tory poodles representing them in Westminster who will simply roll over when the UK government sells fishermen out. That is why they should, of course, elect SNP MPs so that Scotland's voice is, uh, is heard in Westminster. Thank you. Question number five, Bruce Crawford. 
Thank, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. Minister Hamza Youssef. I have this week received a letter from Network Rail Chief Executive Mark Carr, which I have now uh, also placed into spice. In his letter, he advises, uh, and I quote from his letter, regrettably, it's now clear that a safety critical component is susceptible to failure and must be replaced. This will impact on the energisation start date. We are working extremely closely and collaboratively within the ScotRail Alliance to assess how the impact of this challenge can be minimised for passengers, and we will keep officials informed. I have, of course, arranged to meet and speak to Mark Khan to ascertain the full detail of that component failure, which is safety critical. Uh, I will, of course, ensure that members are appropriately kept up to date. Uh, any further delay to Egypt, once again due to network rail, would be extremely disappointing. We remain, of course, focused on the main objective, which is the Edinburgh-Glasgow via Hulk, Falkirk High Route being served by longer electric trains by December 2017. Uh, but this potential further delay again highlights the need for further devolution of governance of Network Rail's projects, which are ordinarily managed out with the ScotRail Alliance. So Network Rail is properly accountable to this Parliament and to this Government, which of course funds its work in Scotland. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Minister for his reply. Is the Minister aware that the planned closure of Kers Road Bridge to enable the electrification of the rail line in the Stilling area is causing understandable concern because of the potential impact on individuals and businesses. Can the Minister outline what mitigation measures are being considered in an effort to, min to minimise disruption and will he provide me with full details on the benefit electrification of the rail line will bring to the Stirling area? And I am sure he is aware that I am standing behind him, so I hope I get a nice reply. <laughs> Minister. I will be very aware uh, of that uh, fact, of course. Uh, can I just say to the member that the work of the Kers Road Bridge, is, as he rightly says, has been delivered as part of the electrification of Stirling Dunblane Alloa uh, line, which will enable a step change in passenger capacity, comfort and ambience, of course, for passengers travelling on these new electric trains on this key route. Uh, the Kers Bridge is owned by Stirling Council and requires significant work to achieve the necessary electrification clearances. Uh, but he is right, of course. I recognise that any closures will cause disruption to the local community. However, Network Rail are working closely with Stirling Council, public utilities and other stakeholders to keep the length of the closure to an absolute minimum. And it is worth reminding them, as well as the potential benefit to the local community of many workers being on site, the SDA project itself involves the electric electrification of 100 single uh, track kilometres of track from Dunblane through to Stirling. That means journey time improvements uh, by up to 10 minutes on the Stirling line services, as well as, as I say, greater capacity uh, and greater comfort, which, of course, is a step change uh, in our railways and I think will be welcomed by passengers uh, across that line. Question number six, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how it's supporting the fish catching industry on the West Coast. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is firmly committed to the fish catching industry in the West Coast. Uh, this year, quota for deep water rock oil had it increased by 45%. Uh, prawn vessels up and down the West Coast have benefited uh, from the end of days at sea regime through the EMFF programme. Uh, the EU uh, and the government have supported diverse projects to develop the industry, including, for example, £600,000 for the provision of harbour facilities and net mending along the west coast at Crinan, uh, Gear Lock, Ullapool, Loch Inver, uh, and indeed the Western Isles. Our strategy for inshore fisheries, which is, of course, so important to the west coast, will also help to develop a more sustainable, profitable and well-managed sector. Uh, we are looking in particular to develop better data for fisheries uh, management with a 1.5 million programme which will support research into the development of an integrated system for the collection, collation, analysis and interrogation of data. Kate Forbes. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware of the changes to the minimum landing sizes for lobsters on the West Coast, resulting in differences between the West and East Coasts. Despite the phased implementation, there are still some concerns for sky fishermen about competitive disadvantage. So would the Minister agree to meet the fishermen who recently met with me to discuss this further? Minister. I do understand, I know the Cabinet Secretary also understands and recognises uh, some of the, the, the concerns as raised by the member. She will know, of course, that this, uh, these changes in minimum landing size were a result of an extensive consultation process during 2016, where new uh, management measures for Scotland's crab and lobster fisheries were announced in January. I know that the member also recognises that at the heart of that uh, is conservation of our stock. Uh, these new measures which, as she says, uh, will include a phased increase from 87 millimetres to 90 millimetres, will be phased over two years. Uh, and I think that will hopefully help to give some element uh, of comfort 
Um, I should say these measures are supported uh, by the, the vast majority of fishermen, uh, though, again, I don't want to, 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 to at all downplay the concerns that have been raised uh, by fishermen to her. So I can tell that the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Fergus Ewing, is meeting the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation on the 25th of May. Uh, part of the delegation uh, from the Federation includes a Sky-based fishermen's leader. I that will provide a timely opportunity uh, to discuss this matter, and I'm sure that the member is fully, uh, fully informed of that conversation. Finlay Carson. The SNP talk about supporting the fishing catching sector. Does the fishing expert believe that withholding 12% of the mackerel quota is supporting the pelagic sector? If this government had any regard for Scotland's processing and catching sector, they would work in collaboration with industry towards increasing landings. Instead, all we see is bully boy tactics. And does the minister, does the minister accept that despite total devolution of inshore fisheries, the Scottish Government have continually neglected the static gear industry at substantial economic cost to Scotland. Minister. The brass neck of the Tory party when it comes to our fishing communities knows no bounds. So we'll continue to stand with fishing communities right across Scotland. But let me just say this to the member, as a result of, of course, yesterday's vote, the majority of this parliament decided that whatever happens in the Brexit process on exiting EU, that we must have powers in this Parliament, full powers over fisheries. And he has a choice and his party have a choice. Will they stand with this Parliament with a majority vote, demanded control over those powers? Will they stand with Scotland's fishing communities or will they roll over when the UK Government once again sells Scotland's fishermen down the river? Question number seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what infrastructure investment it has made in the North East and what future investment it is planned to make the area better connected. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has invested in major projects within the North East, including the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Routes, Balmeri Tipperty Road Scheme, the Emergency Care Centre in Aberdeen, and significant investment in school buildings, including the completion of 16 new schools across the region. Our recent infrastructure investment plan progress update highlighted that major infrastructure projects within the North East region totalling more than £1.3 billion are currently in construction or are estimated to be in construction during this year alone. Looking forward, we have infrastructure investment plan for the Aberdeen to Inverness rail improvements, the A96 duelling programme between Inverness and Aberdeen, and the A90-A96 Horrigan Junction improvement. We also have Digital Scotland Superfast broadband programmes to extend fibre broadband access to at least 95% of premises in Scotland by the end of 2017, and 100% superfast broadband coverage by 2021. Finally, we will also invest £125 million in the Aberdeen City Region deal and a further £254 million in North East infrastructure over the same five to ten year period. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I very much welcome the over £1 billion that is being invested in the North East. In particular, upgrading the A96 will be a huge boost. But is the Cabinet Secretary aware of environmental concern about one of the proposed routes uh, east of Inverurie? How does he intend to respond to these concerns in relation to Benachy? I am, as Stuart Stevenson says, very well aware of the concerns, not least from the representations received from Gillian Martin and from others. And I've made it clear to Transport Scotland I want to have, uh, be able to demonstrate the utmost regard for the environment, including a particularly uh, popular local uh, site that he's mentioned at Benahi, that that should be taken into account, consistent with the process that he will know that we have to go through. As for all major road schemes, meaningful engagement with communities forms a key part of our work as we develop our plans, and we expect the next stage of our design and assessment process to start later this summer. So please be reassured that the concerns expressed by Save Benahi, the campaign, along with the concerns of others in the area, will be carefully considered and taken into account. Lewis MacDonald. At the very end of his first answer, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned an additional £254 million of uh, investment in infrastructure in North East Scotland. Can he tell us today whether that will or will not include duelling of the East Coast Railway Line at Montrose, uh, which is something on which he commented at the time of the original announcement? Cabinet Secretary. 
The member will be aware that that uh, £254 million, pounds, which I mentioned, does indeed uh, relate to improvements on that line. It was part of the Aberdeen City deal, the extent to which we went much further than the UK Government in ex extending that city deal. Its design, though, it is to make sure that we improve the journey times between uh, Aberdeen uh, and the Central Belt, and of course that will be done. The exact nature of the development, whether it's duelling, particularly the stress point, which um, is well known to the member, has been uh, considered, is being considered by Transport Scotland, and I'm happy to provide a written update to the member if you'd like that. Thank you very much. That concludes general.